Tā neticība jūs skatienā ir vienkārši burvīgi. Fraser! Here you come. Good luck. Thank you. Thank you. Hello. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, very nice to meet you. A huge pleasure to have been invited to your beautiful city today and a great honor to follow so many great speakers who've already spoken today. Uh, my name is Fraser Doherty. I'm 27 years old. I come from Edinburgh in Scotland and I'm the founder of a jam company called Super Jam. And I was very kindly invited here today to share my story with you. And that's the story of how I learned my grandmother's secret jam recipe at the age of 14. And over the past nine or 10 years, I've turned her recipes into a company that has since sold millions of jars of jam through thousands of stores around the world. I guess you could say that my adventure as an entrepreneur began at an unusually young age. And in fact, ever since I was a little boy, I was involved in coming up with ideas to try and start my own business. And probably the strangest story of all came from when I was about 10 years old. And I visited a chicken farm with my childhood friend. And my friend and I, as 10-year-old boys, thought it was a great business. The farmer just had to feed the chickens, and he could steal their eggs and sell them. <laughs> and so we convinced the farmer to give us a free box of eggs, which we took home to my mom and dad, and explained that we'd had this great business idea, that we would keep the eggs warm so they would hatch, and we would start our own chicken farm in the back garden. <laughs> and as I'm sure you can imagine, my parents weren't too excited about this business idea of turning the house into a farm, but they let us give it a shot, not really expecting that two 10-year-old boys could find a way of hatching eggs. And so we put the box of eggs on top of the TV, <laughs> where it was kind of warm. And amazingly, a few weeks later, four of the eggs hatched into little chickens. And, I mean, the poor things, they probably thought that Jerry Springer was their mum uh, <laughs> being born on top of a TV. Um, but soon they were big enough to go out into the back garden. They started laying eggs, and we sold the eggs to the neighbors. So that was my first ever business at the age of 10. <laughs> Thank you. Unfortunately, though, my career as a chicken farmer was sadly cut short one afternoon when the local fox decided to eat my chickens for dinner. And as tragic and upsetting as that day was, it didn't put me off completely, and I continued to come up with more and more business ideas. And that experience taught me my first ever lesson in business, which was that, at the very least, your business idea probably better not have any natural predators. <laughs> and so, one afternoon, at 14 years old, I was visiting my grandmother. And she was making jam in her kitchen, just in the same way as she had for as long as I can remember. And that's a picture of my grandmother there. Uh, she's the one in the middle. Uh, <laughs> and I got really excited about it, and I asked my gran to teach me how to make jam. And we spent the afternoon cooking a few jars together. And the same day, I ran around to the supermarket, and I bought some fruit and made a few jars of my own. And before they'd even cooled down, I took them around the neighborhood and asked the neighbors what they thought. And thankfully, the neighbors at least told me that they enjoyed these first few jars of jam that I had ever made and asked if they could start buying it from me every couple of weeks. And so I was soon making deliveries door to door out of a little plastic bucket all over the local area. After a while, the media heard about this story of a young guy taking his grandmother's jam recipes and making a little business out of them. And that's an article from page three of the Edinburgh Evening News <laughs> from when I was about 15, uh, which I guess probably just meant there wasn't really anything happening in Edinburgh that day. <laughs> for something like that to make it into the news. But following the excitement of being written about in the local newspaper, I decided to leave school. And I started working full time on trying to turn my jam-making hobby into my career. And so I soon found myself 
cooking jam all day, every day, <laughs> in my parents' tiny little kitchen, cooking up to a thousand jars of jam a week, and selling them at farmers' markets all over Scotland. Soon I got to the point where my parents couldn't get into the kitchen to cook the dinner anymore, and I realized I would have to come up with some kind of big idea to move production into a factory. And so I started doing a lot of research, and I found out that, unfortunately, sales of jam have been falling for maybe 20 years, mostly because jam is very unhealthy. It's usually 70, sometimes 80 percent sugar, often contains a lot of additives. And I guess when I looked at the other brands of jam on the supermarket shelves, I figured they were very traditional, they were kind of boring, Nothing had changed for a very long time, and I just figured that maybe I could come up with a healthier and more modern and more fun brand of jam. And so hundreds of batches and lots of recipes later, in my parents' tiny little kitchen, I came up with a way of making jam 100% from fruit, uh, without adding any sugar or anything artificial. I soon had a few flavors that I thought tasted pretty nice, and probably quite naively decided I was going to try and sell them to the big supermarkets. And that was something that a teenager had never done before, but I got my big break, I guess, when I got a chance to pitch my idea to Waitrose, one of the big supermarkets in the UK. And Waitrose hosts Meet the Buyer Days. And Meet the Buyer Days, I like to describe as the X factor of selling groceries to supermarkets. <laughs> and hundreds of people show up, and stand in a queue, holding their homemade cakes and soups and sauces, and everybody gets 10 minutes to pitch their idea, in my case, to the senior jam buyer of Waitrose. <laughs> and he said it was a great idea. He said it was a, made a lot of sense to make jam 100% from fruit. He said it was uh, quite fun to see a 16-year-old kid turning up in my dad's suit, <laughs> probably two sizes too big for me, as you can see. <laughs> But he explained that there was a long way to go until I would ever have a product I could sell to a supermarket. He explained that I'd have to come up with labels that would get my message across. I'd have to set up production in a factory and offer him a good price. And I'd have to do a bit more work on my recipes before he'd be happy. But he promised that if I could do all of that, I'd be welcome to go back, maybe in a year's time, and he'd think about giving it a shot. So having met with Waitrose, it became my dream to one day see my products on their shelves. And I began by trying to create the Super Jam brand, the design of the labels and the website and everything else. And working with some designers, we figured that there was a link between Super Jam and Superman, or so we thought, and decided to create a brand around a comic book theme. And we had a lot of fun writing jokes on the labels and on the lids, and we even spoke about making a superhero costume for me, the jam boy, to wear at the launch, <laughs> which I was quite looking forward to. So we then had this set of labels that I thought looked pretty cool, and definitely my teenage friends at the time thought were very funny. And I began trying to solve the problem of how to produce hundreds of thousands of jars of jam to sell to the big supermarkets. And obviously, at 17 years old, I wasn't going to be able to build my own jam factory. I would have to convince an existing jam company to work with me to make my recipes on a big scale. And so I traveled around the country, from the tiny little islands in Scotland to the big cities in England, trying to find somebody with a jam factory who was willing to work with me. And as I'm sure you can imagine, most of these hundred-year-old, very traditional family businesses were a little bit skeptical of a 17-year-old kid turning up with no money and no experience and no idea how supermarkets worked and no idea how factories worked. But eventually, I found one factory who had suffered from jam sales falling over the years. They had some extra capacity, and they figured that maybe my idea was worth a shot. And so, having met the factory, we figured out how to produce my recipes in their factory on a big scale. And I figured I was ready to start supplying Waitrose. 
<laughs> which was didn't agree. <laughs> uh, they explained the fact that super jam was made 100% from fruit and was all natural, has all been completely lost in all the jokes and humor on the comic book labels. They said the factory I chose was way too expensive, and they didn't even like the flavors I'd made. So basically everything that I'd just spent a year working on had to be thrown in the bin, and I started all over again. So I traveled around a bit more, and eventually convinced a new factory to work with me. The designers and I sat down and had a really good think about who we were trying to communicate with. Who was going to buy this super jam? And I guess we clarified to ourselves that it wouldn't be kids and teenagers and my friends who might have thought the comic book idea was funny, but it'd be adults. And we'd have to communicate really simply that Super Jam was 100% fruit. And so we went through a few new designs and eventually came up with a design that hopefully works. Uh, it's very different to the comic book idea and definitely very different to the traditional jam packaging I showed you at the start. And thankfully, after all of that, Waitrose agreed. And they launched Super Jam in all of their 300 supermarkets about 10 years ago now. And that, of course, meant we had to do the first production run in the factory, which was a very exciting and quite an emotional day. I think we made something like 50,000 jars of Super Jam on the first day. And when Super Jam launched, there was this huge amount of media coverage. And I had no idea that this would happen, but I found myself being interviewed in newspapers, in magazines, on the radio, and even on TV. And I guess to try and take advantage of all of this media coverage, I decided to go on a sort of rock and roll style tour. <laughs> around all the supermarkets, uh, handing out samples and signing jars of jam and <laughs> uh, <laughs> telling people all about my gran and my story. And I think on the first day in one store in Edinburgh, where I come from, they sold more than one and a half thousand jars of super jam in one day, which was more jam than they would normally sell in a whole month. They'd never seen anything like it. And I think it got to the point where if anybody tried to go through the checkout without buying any Super Jam, the person working on the checkout would ask if they'd forgotten. <laughs> and so then we had a big party when we sold the millionth jar. Uh, we launched in a couple thousand more supermarkets. I was invited to have dinner with the Prime Minister at the time, Gordon Brown, at Downing Street, which was kind of cool. My grandmother and I were invited to Buckingham Palace. <laughs> And we were given a medal by Prince Charles, which was a very nice day out for my grandmother. Super Jam was entered into the National Museum of Scotland. <laughs> As an example of an iconic Scottish brand, alongside Iron Brew and Baxter's Soup and Tonox Tea Cakes. <laughs> um, more recently, I took part in a BBC TV show. Myself and some other young entrepreneurs, we visited a number of companies that were having a hard time. They were maybe going to go out of business. And uh, originally, we told them we were doing work experience. So we worked in their business for a couple of days and then turned around and said, we're not really here to do work experience. We're going to hopefully give you some advice and uh, help them to redesign their stores, redesign their branding, and turn things around. So that was a lot of fun. But probably the biggest promotion that we ever did was we gave away a free jar of Super Jam to every reader of the Sun newspaper. And I think about five and a half million people read the Sun every day. It's the biggest newspaper in the English-speaking world. And so my proudest moment of all as a Scottish person was being able to share the very front page of the Sun with Scotland's national icon, uh, who you might remember from uh, Britain's Got Talent, Miss Susan Boyle. <laughs> um, more recently, I made my debut on QVC, the home TV shopping channel. And I go on there and tell the story, and people pick up their phones and buy jam through their TV. And that's been a surprising success. Uh, we've launched Super Jam in countries as far away from home as China, 
Uh, we've also selling in Australia, uh, where I was invited on uh, their morning TV show. Uh, we've also got a few stores in Russia selling our products, but the country that we've had the most success in uh, has been South Korea. And we're selling in department stores there, bakery stores, uh, all kinds of different places. Uh, but the exciting thing is we, we do home TV shopping. And so I was invited on uh, this show, and I even practiced uh, learning a few words in Korean, uh, which we'll play to you in a couple of seconds. <laughs> I actually have no idea what I said. Uh, <laughs> they just tell me what to say, so could be could be saying anything there, I don't know. <laughs> uh, but our success on this home TV shopping show was all thanks to this lady here. Uh, her name is Che Yura, and she is South Korea's answer to Oprah Winfrey. <laughs> And she heard about my story and invited me on her home TV shopping show. And she said, well, you better learn some Korean. And this was the first time I had been there. And I practiced and practiced and practiced and tried my best. And we spent two days filming this show. Uh, a few weeks later, I sit down to watch the finished episode on TV, uh, which is 40 minutes long. And unfortunately, my part of the show had been edited out down to less than one minute. And I don't know what I said in Korean, but it, it didn't quite work. And for the rest of the show, I was replaced with a cardboard cutout. <laughs> there he is there. <laughs> so this was a, a low point of my career, uh, <laughs> being replaced with cardboard. It's my grandmother, slightly confused, watching the show. She said I look a bit skinny. <laughs> um, in Korea, we're, we're selling in lots of uh, different ways with um, some Korean advertising. But something that we've done, which is a, a slightly strange twist to the story, is that we launched an exclusive range of jams with South Korea's number one K-pop group, <laughs> Super Junior. Uh, so we're selling these to teenage girls all over South Korea. Uh, which isn't something I ever imagined uh, would be a market for our product, but there you go. We also do, do a honey with a, a different pop band. <laughs> uh, when we recently launched in Japan, my life story was made into a dramatized TV reenactment, <laughs> an hour long TV drama. And my part, my part of the film was uh, played by a, a small Indian boy <laughs> as the actor. <laughs> I think something got lost in translation, perhaps, <laughs> but never mind. Uh, I think I'll, I'll show you a little clip from this. It's the, the highlight of my entire life so far, to be honest. Ika Fraser, その伝統レシピで様々なジャムを何十年も作り続けてきた。おばあちゃんのジャムを初めて食べたクレイザー君は。ああ。このジャムすごく美味しい。売ってるのとは全然違うね。そう、ありがとう。失敗したっていい。思い
exactly how it happened in real life, <laughs> I can assure you. Um, we recently launched a range of uh, peanut butters. Uh, normally, peanut butter has a lot of salt and sugar and fat added to it, but we made a peanut butter that's 100% peanuts, so a bit healthier and even more tasty. But something I'm very excited about has been setting up a honey business. And to give you a little bit of background, when, my, when I was a, a kid, uh, one of our neighbors had some beehives in his back garden. And as a kid, I thought they were fascinating. And he taught me all about how to look after bees. He taught me all about why bees are important for the environment. And more recently, I figured that maybe that was an experience that other kids would like to have. And so since then, we've set up community beehives around the UK. And we partner groups of kids with experienced beekeepers, teach kids about bees, teach them about the environment, and hopefully do something about the problem that I'm sure you all know bees are facing. And these are some of our beehives uh, on the roofs of buildings in Seoul in South Korea. We've got about 200 beehives all around one of the biggest cities in the world. Um, and of course, we sell the honey that the bees make. And for me, this idea of trying to run a business in a way that hopefully does more than just makes money, but hopefully does some good, was inspired for me when I was a kid. And I read this book about an American ice cream company called Ben and & Jerry's. And I'm sure you've all tried their ice cream, but you might not know that Ben & Jerry were kind of hippies. They grew up in the 60s. And they say that they became friends because they were the two fattest kids at school. <laughs> They discovered, of course, that they both loved ice cream. They started making it, they bought a petrol station, turned it into an ice cream shop, and the rest is history. They went on to sell billions of dollars worth of ice cream. But what I thought was cool about it wasn't just that they had built a successful business, but was that they had at least tried to use their business to stand up for some things they cared about. And so they used their packaging to protest about climate change, or women's rights, or how much the American government spends on war, things that normally an ice cream company wouldn't talk about. They were also pioneers of fair trade, the idea of trying to be responsible about where your ingredients come from. And so a couple years ago, I got to meet my hero, Jerry. And he ended up sending me to Uganda, in Africa, where I got to visit some farmers who were growing vanilla and cocoa. Uh, I had no idea that's what cocoa looked like on a tree. And the cocoa farmer had never eaten chocolate. Uh, so we ate a bar of chocolate together, and we finally both knew the whole story. I got to live with a, a family uh, for about a week. And they were growing vanilla, fair trade for the ice cream. And of course, they were very, very poor. Uh, they had no electricity, no running water. They couldn't really let all their kids go to school. They needed them to help in the field. And the most expensive thing they owned was this very sad cow tied up behind their house. But as well as being a, a very humbling experience, it inspired for my friend and I an idea that maybe we could start a business importing an ingredient from the developing world, and we could sell it directly to our customers over the internet. And so this inspired us to start a business called Envelope Coffee, which is an online coffee subscription club. And I started it with my friend Lennart. He's Dutch. Uh, he lives in Amsterdam. And the unusual thing about Lenny is that he doesn't have any sense of smell. And so whenever I visit him in his apartment, uh, he'll hold up a towel and he'll say, hey, does this smell? <laughs> it does, Lenny, yeah. <laughs> So as well as being kind of funny, uh, you might know if someone's blind, they might have very good hearing. Well, if somebody doesn't have any smell, they often have very, very sensitive taste buds. And so Lenny discovered that he had this unusual talent. He became interested in coffee. And now coffee companies send him all around the world to Africa and South America, and Central America, to taste coffee. And so he told me about this, and I thought it was fascinating. And so we decided to start a business together, importing coffee. And as part of this business, uh, we visited Colombia, South America, to buy coffee. And while we were there, we uh, got, to, got to travel around a little bit, 
uh, but we headed out into the countryside and we spent some time uh, with a man called Juan Pablo. That's him there. And Juan Pablo is uh, one of Colombia's biggest coffee experts. This is a man who tastes 600 cups of coffee a day. And so he's full of energy. Uh, <laughs> He gets about two hours sleep a night, I think. <laughs> and when he's not sleeping, he's thinking about coffee. And so with him, we uh, tasted about 100 of the best coffees from all around Colombia. We found a really delicious cup. It was perfect. It was exactly what we were looking for. And so we decided we were going to look up the farmer's details. We were going to go there, track them down, shake hands, and buy their coffee straight from them and cut out all the middlemen who normally make all the money in the coffee business. So of course that sends us on a wild goose chase, two flights up into the Andes Mountains, an eight-hour drive along this dangerous cliff face of a road, until eventually we arrived in the most beautiful little village I'd ever seen. It was about a thousand meters above sea level, very, very high up in the Andes Mountains. It was underneath a volcano, so the soil was very fertile. It was the perfect place to grow coffee. And the people in the village, there was about a thousand of them, and they were all completely relying on the coffee harvest and the international coffee price for their livelihoods. And they were pretty happy to see us. Um, until recently, the area had been quite dangerous because of the cocaine business and other kinds of violence, but now it was safe enough for people like us to go there and buy their coffee. And so we visited various different fields. Leonard, Leonard's a real expert in the plants, and uh, we agreed to buy the harvest from a particular family, uh, which we've done for the past three years, brought it over to Scotland, roasted it, sent it out to our customers. And as well as getting to find an amazing coffee, we also got to make a really nice friendship with the farmers who grew it for us. And for us, that's something very special. So that's envelope coffee. Another business that I've been involved in starting is called Beer 52. And it's an online craft beer club. And I started it with my friend James Brown. And he originally went on a motorcycle road trip all around Europe. And he stopped at craft breweries and craft beer pubs along the way. And he discovered that there's about 14,000 microbreweries all around the world making amazing beer but very often only really selling their beer in their local area. And so we thought, wouldn't it be a great idea to make a club? And each month we will go to a different country, we'll pick the best beers and send them out to our members in the post. And so we started this business about three years ago. Since then, more than 150,000 people have joined our club. Uh, we've worked with about 300 of the world's best breweries, sent out millions and millions of bottles of beer, and had the pleasure of tasting many of them ourselves. Uh, as part of this business, we employ a beer taster, and uh, we pay her a salary, which I always think is the worst deal I ever cut. <laughs> I'm sure someone would volunteer to do that for free. Um, every month is a different theme. We visit a new country. We produce a magazine all about that particular month. We also produce a little video. I'll show you one uh, so you can get an idea of how it works. Part of Beer 52, we produce a magazine which goes in the box. Uh, we also sell it in a couple of thousand stores in the UK. And each month we focus on a different country. We've been to Denmark, we did a, a tour around Scotland, and recently uh, went over to Colorado in America where they have about 300 different microbreweries, some amazing, amazing beers. And uh, the magazine is, uh, we work with great illustrators and photographers and chefs to make recipes that go well with food. And for people who are interested in craft beer, uh, it's a real hobby to learn all about the breweries, to learn about how the beers are made, and to read about these different travels that we've been on. 
Uh, I have one more video about Beer 52, uh, which is a little clip that we made uh, after we recently visited Colorado. <laughs> Howdy all. This month with Beer 52 and Ferment Magazine, we're exploring the beautiful state of Colorado in search of some of America's best craft beers. In this month's case, we're bringing you some Colorado beers that we discovered on our trip that have never before been on sale in the UK. We spent a day at Oscar Blues watching them brew Dale's Pale Ale, the first craft beer in a can. In Ferment, Matt Curtis will be sharing with us his thoughts on this pioneering brewery alongside stories about Odell Brewing and Left Hand. I got the chance to interview Adam Avery, one of America's most famous brewers, about the future of barrel aging, sours and mega hoppy, high strength big beers. In Denver we tasted more than a hundred beers in a day. We just about killed them. Don't say we don't work hard to find you the best beers. And just to be sure our thirst for craft alcohol was thoroughly quenched, we checked out some New Age American spirits, drinking bourbon from the barrel and moonshine from the jar, meeting Midwestern pioneers shaking up the American spirit scene. We've put together a guide to Denver's nightlife so that you can do the same, hitting the best bars and tap rooms along the way in this city of more than a hundred craft breweries. Before heading to the airport, we took the chance to ride a horse called Lucky through the Rocky Mountains with a real cowboy in Lovely. Come and join us for this all-American craft beer experience in this month's Beer 52 and Ferment Magazine. I think that explains how, we, how, how it works. Um, some, some days we have to taste about 100 beers, uh, which is a, a very tough job, I'm sure you can, you can imagine. Um, we're very excited to be working on an invention, which we think is going to solve a huge problem for mankind. It's called the beer button, and it has a little magnet on the back. You can stick it on the side of your fridge, and when you run out of beer, you just push the button. It sends us a message over your home Wi-Fi. We know what kind of beer you like. We package up a new box and deliver it the next day. <laughs> so we're very excited about that. I guess Super Jam and these other ideas have very gratefully received a number of awards. And I'm not telling you about them to boast by any means. But the one that I'm most proud of was called the Global Student Entrepreneur of the Year Award. And this was a competition where about 700 kids from all around the world were invited to America to do a pitch about our business to a panel of judges. And most of the other kids in the competition were running dot-com businesses, software companies, iPhone apps, and I was there selling jam. <laughs> and amazingly won the award. And I got to meet some other kids who had started their own businesses, which for me was very inspiring. I made a lot of friends from it. But I guess a, a kind of a lesson in that story, if you like, might be that a good idea doesn't have to be high tech. A lot of great ideas are. But a good idea definitely doesn't have to reinvent the wheel. And I like to say that it's possible to make something extraordinary out of something as ordinary as jam. And so I guess from the point of view of sales and media coverage and even winning a few awards, it's all been quite an adventure and I guess something of a success. And that's all fine and well. But something I'm very excited about and ambitious for has been setting up a charity. And to give you a little bit of background, when my grandmother originally made jam, she would make jam and scones and cakes and she would visit all the elderly people in her neighborhood and maybe they were living on their own a little lonely or maybe they were in a care home sometimes in hospital and at the weekends she would drag my little brother and I with her and we had no idea why as children but my little brother would play his guitar and I would tell them stories and I guess it was something that my gran felt strongly about and so I thought it would be nice to try and do something like that 
on a big scale. And a few years ago, about eight years ago now, we started running completely free tea parties in community centers, town halls, care homes, hospitals, originally just in Scotland, but we now have them all over the UK. Uh, we have them in Korea and Japan. Uh, we've even had some in America, although in America we don't call them tea parties. Uh, <laughs> turns out that means something over there. Um, as you can see, the biggest tea parties have as many as 600 people come along. We have more than 100 tea parties every year, and so thousands of people have come along and had a nice time. And I guess to help explain the, the tea parties, I have a, a final short video, uh, which is uh, from a, a news show uh, in Scotland a few years ago, um, which will explain it for you. You don't need a Mad Hatter or a Cheshire Cat to have a wonderful tea party, just plenty of jam and scones. Today's tea party at Edinburgh's Meadowbank Stadium was set up by Fraser Doherty, the young entrepreneur who transformed his grand secret jam recipe into a multi-million pound super jam business. My grandmother taught me how to make jam when I was 14 and that's what started Super Jam off. When my gran originally made jam, she would make jam and scones and cakes and take them to all the elderly people in her area who were living alone and they were a little bit lonely and nobody really visited them very much and she would take my little brother and I with her at the weekends and um, so I guess it, visiting and caring for the elderly was something that my gran felt very strongly about and the tea party is an opportunity for me to give back to my gran's generation. So what are you hoping that the tea parties will achieve? Well, the idea is very simple. Um, a lot of the people who come along here live in care homes or sheltered housing or they live alone and the opportunity to make new friends and have a bit of fun on an afternoon is, is quite rare for them. And so this is an opportunity for them to, to just have a bit of fun, some jam and get up and have a dance if they like. It brings back very happy memories of when I was a youngster, teenager, dancing in the city here in Princess Street Gardens and, and Marine down at Portobello. I just love this. It's just wonderful and can't get enough. And why do you think it's a good idea to lay it on to let all the older people come here this afternoon? A lot of old people are on their own and they need some entertainment. And this mm -hmm. is what is good for us. You know, it keeps us active, it keeps us moving, it keeps us meeting people. That, that's a best idea. <laughs> Thousands of elderly people have come along and had a fun afternoon and made new friends and I've got a wall covered in letters from the guests who've come along and, and just told me how special it is. One gentleman told him that it made him feel like a person again. I was hoping to get a scone myself, but I don't see any. They've all gone. Where's your secret stash? We, we always bring more scones to each tea party and, and every time we run out, I think everybody just, just enjoys the scones and jam and uh, sometimes they can eat up to four scones each. <laughs> Fraser had its first tea party last June. There have since been over 100 events and the plan is to roll about on a regular basis across the country. The aim being not only to give the older generation a chance to go out and have some fun, but also to interact with the younger generation. How am I doing, Walter? Yes, fine. Should we try another turn? Yes. Okay. Probably the best part of running the tea parties is uh, interacting with the elderly people and, and just hearing their stories. Some of the guests are over 100 years old and you know they've lived through uh, wars, they've lived through the invention of television, of all sorts of things and uh, their stories are just incredible and, and often inspirational. And has your grand been along to one of the tea dances? What does she think? My, my grand's very excited about the tea parties. It's, a, it's an issue that she feels very strongly about and to be able to give back to her generation is, is really special to me. Thank you. Um, so I guess the big idea now for the tea parties has been to really open them up so that anybody, anywhere, can volunteer to start their own tea party in their local community. And so we have a website, people apply online, and we send them, of course, some jam, but perhaps more importantly, a little money, so they can hire a venue, hire a band, get some nice food and drink, and have a really nice party. And by making it really easy for people to volunteer means that we can have hundreds more tea parties in the future. And I guess to help pay for all of these tea parties, a few years ago my grandmother and I decided to share our jam making secrets with the world by writing a cookbook all about how to make jam without adding sugar, 
how to make traditional British cakes and puddings and desserts that have jam in them. I've also written a little book called Super Business, all about my story and all the things that have happened over these years and some of the things that I've learned. And the books have <laughs> gone on to uh, be published in Korean and <laughs> Chinese and Japanese. <laughs> I'm not exactly sure what they say either, uh, but my grandmother and I are very happy nonetheless. And more recently, I wrote a book called 48 Hour Startup, which is a book uh, all about how to start your own business without having to quit your job, without having to borrow a lot of money. I think a lot of people dream of starting a business, but they worry that they're going to have to jump in at the deep end and borrow money or pitch to an investor or quit school or quit their job. But I wanted to show that you can start something on a small scale uh, in the weekend, even as fast as a weekend, and then it can grow into something more. And so in the book, I, I underwent an experiment. I wanted to try and create a new product in just two days. And so I went from a blank piece of paper, where everybody starts when they try and come up with an idea, went through various different ideas, and eventually created a brand. And in the book, I talk about how to find a designer, how to create packaging and branding really fast. I created a product, a porridge oats, luxury porridge oats product. Um, and launched it, created a website. And I don't know how to code, uh, but it's possible to, to set up a website very easily. Uh, there's a lot of online tools. And so in the book, I, I kind of share some of these tips and tricks and shortcuts that I've discovered over the years. And hopefully, it's helpful to other people who maybe want to start their own business. And so I guess that's kind of my story. And perhaps what my story shows is that Something that can begin for anybody as a very simple idea in a kitchen or a bedroom or a garage or a garden shed with a bit of love and imagination and hard work can grow into something amazing, can grow into something that changes your life. I know that Super Jam has certainly changed mine. Can grow into something that gives you a career and hopefully a chance to give something back to your community. I guess there's a number of people that I need to thank for making my story possible. Not least, of course, my beautiful grandmother for teaching me how to make jam in the first place and inspiring the work that we do with the elderly. Uh, my grandmother is thankfully unaware of her intellectual property rights. Uh, <laughs> hasn't come chasing me for royalties. Uh, no, she, she's very proud of everything that's happened, of course. Uh, my grandmother visits her local supermarket, checks all the labels are facing the front, <laughs> turns the competitors around the wrong way. <laughs> uh, my parents for uh, letting me cook jam in their kitchen for years on end. And I guess the last people I need to thank on my amazing adventure are all of you for uh, very, very kindly having me here today. It's been a real honor to come and share my story with you. Uh, I think we have a little bit of time for questions, yep. uh, if there's anything anyone would like to ask. But other than that, Paldis. <laughs> Thank you. Well, here we go. Yeah, Drosh, yeah. Mm -hmm. Hi, um, my name is Evgenia, and uh, I have a jewelry business, Yayoi. Follow me on Instagram, Yayoi Jewelry. <laughs> <laughs> and I have a question about like your parents. Uh, mm -hmm. When you said at 14 years uh, that you want to drop out of school, they said like, oh, okay, do the <laughs> business, or uh, did they support you as mm. well? Or on only your grandmother <laughs> believed in you? <laughs> great question. Um, and whose money was that, actually? <laughs> yeah. Yeah, great question. Uh, my dad is, was a teacher, uh, so he, my, my family were quite pro-school. <laughs> um, but they always told my little brother and I that the most important thing in life is that you do something you love. Uh, they said, if you can find something that you love and do that every day, then that's success. And the funny thing is, if you work on something that you love, you end up working hard. And if you work hard, you've got a chance at being a success. And it sounds, sounds like a cliche, but, it, but it's true. 
Uh, so my parents always told me to do something I loved, and when I told them I was going to leave school and make jam every day, I think that was a bit of a surprise, uh, and they didn't think it was going to work, but they didn't try to stop me. And I was very lucky in that sense. I guess at 10 years old, I asked my parents, can I try and hatch the eggs on top of the TV? And a lot of parents would have said, that won't work, no. But they said, yeah, sure, you can try. And they didn't think it would work, but uh, turned out to. <laughs> but you are aware that now a lot of uh, youngsters are inspired to leave the school and do the business just because you did and succeeded. Um, no, I, I think everybody has to make their own choice, for sure. Uh, I think that a great way to learn is just by trying things in the real world. And even when kids are at school, you know, parents and teachers should encourage them to you know, try, try projects in the weekends and after school and uh, set up their own little businesses. It doesn't have to be a case of quitting school or doing a business. Like, I think you can, you can do uh, How do you think? Uh, what is bigger, your story or your jam, <laughs> um, the product? Yeah, it's a great question. I think um, a huge part of the reason this has worked is, I guess, people like the story. And, uh, of course, they like the jam, otherwise they wouldn't, they wouldn't keep buying it um, over and over. But I think everybody has a story that they can tell. I think everybody has some kind of brand that they can create and tell a story, uh, whatever it is that, that you're doing. There's some reason why everybody does what they're doing, and part of the trick is figuring out what your story is and how to tell it. Mm -hmm. um, people will say, well, that's easy for you because you've got this cute story of you and your gran. I didn't start out with my <laughs> gran. Um, but I think there's some kind of story that Hello, my name is Liene. I work as a business coach and I'm exactly helping people to start the business. And obviously your story is absolutely beautiful, fantastic and successful. I would like to know more about your dark parts and the difficulties because the beauty is Amazing, mm. but I'm sure as a businessman, because I uh, also have 10 years of experience, okay. and I know there are ups and downs, Absolutely. and so I would like to hear about those dark parts. Great question. The dark side of the <laughs> dark thing. Um, no, I don't, I don't have a dark side, but uh, <laughs> um, I do uh, think, of course, anybody who's been involved in starting a business knows that most things don't work. When, you, when I'd go and try and sell jam for the first time, I had to knock on 20 doors before even one person bought the first jar. So I could have given up after 5 or 10 or 15 doors. And I guess uh, whatever it is that you're doing is not going to work first time around. So you have to go into things accepting right away that it's not going to work first time. And that's part of the process. Mm -hmm. And it would be quite painful for me to talk you through all of my my kind of idea graveyard of all of the ideas we've tried that haven't just worked. Just the most, most expensive failure you have had. Um, <laughs> well, after we did the tea parties, uh, I, w I would visit elderly people. and They would have food delivered, meals on wheels, we call it. And uh, the food wasn't very good, it wasn't very healthy. And so I thought, well, maybe we could start a business doing healthy meals on wheels for elderly people. So we started this business. It's called Super Meals. Uh, <laughs> I think you can see how I come up with names. And, uh, <laughs> and then um, it didn't really work. Uh, elderly people don't have the internet. Uh, so an internet no. business for that age group wasn't, wasn't going to work, I think. Um, uh, but it was, I learned, learned a lot from it. And don't, don't regret how much? A failure. <laughs> I think like 30 or 50,000 pounds, something like that. I, no. just, I always believe in test something on a, a small scale as you can. Uh, you know, create the first version of your product, go out there, take a stall at a market, try and sell it to people. Mm -hmm. And then the most important thing is listen to what people say. So many entrepreneurs create a product, put it out into the world. People give them feedback and they go, I don't want to, I don't want to know. <laughs> my, my grandmother knows better. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Pede, so that's the last question. No, last two questions, yeah. please. Okay. Yeah. Oh. Yeah. Let's go. Tur ir viens jautājums. A un šeit. Sākam. Yeah. Sākam tur un tad šeit. Labi, šeit tad tādā gadījumā sākam okay. šeit. Okay. Uh, hi, Fraser. Hello. I'm Paul and I'm also involved in different international businesses from sourcing engineers to connecting Latvia to the Arab world and uh, I have also many lessons uh, learned. Uh, of course, uh, you sh I guess you agree with me that you can uh, love things 
as much as you like, you can work as much as you uh, as hard, uh, but at the end of the day, most of the people are stuck with uh, lack of funding. Uh, let's go deeper in your story, in your super story. Uh, how you, uh, who, who was a backup for your switch from kitchen production to yeah. first outsourced production for Waitrose? Uh, it costs a lot, I know. Exactly, great question. Um, so yeah, how did I finance going from the kitchen to the supermarket you know, into our factory? And a lot of the time people have an idea, uh, but they're terrified that it's going to cost a lot of money to start their business. They're going to have to borrow a whole lot of money or sell their house or sell their car. But actually you can test things out very small scale for not a lot of money and then grow from there. And I think the best thing to do is to start on a small scale, uh, not to jump in at the deep end and risk everything. And so in my case, I started out by making 12 jars of jam, sold those, made 20, then made 30, 40, and grew like that. And then eventually, when I had to move into the factory, I was 17, my parents don't have any money. Uh, I couldn't borrow money from a bank at 17. I think an investor wouldn't have, wouldn't have invested in the business at that time. And so I was able to convince the factory to provide credit terms on the first order. Um, so often that's a way that you can finance your business that, that people don't immediately think of, that your supplier if they can get excited about your idea, if they can feel like it's their baby as well as yours, then you know, they, can, they can certainly help you finance it. Okay, thank you. Welcome to your times. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, <coughs> dear gentlemen, I'm a small veteran entrepreneur, yeah? and uh, really have a question. Really, really, you, uh, do you have experience to drink coffee with beer? Mm -hmm. We have not uh, this experience. Uh, we can uh, see yeah. <laughs> our guest is uh, a specialist. Now you just, uh, just sold your business idea for free. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> okay, thank you. So how do you see? How do you see? Is there a, probably some uh, business into uh, making coffee and beer as a product? Coffee and beer. Yeah. Coffee, beer, wow. Yeah. Solves two problems at once. <laughs> <laughs> Breakfast. <laughs> there you go. Yes, thank you very much. It was a very nice idea. Yeah, not yet done, but it will be done now. Okay, pēdējais jautājums, Lūdzu, mums ir tieši laiks vienam jautājumam. Ir, jā? Ā, rekur. Un tad vēl pēdējais tur. Aiziet. Ceram, ka vēl kāds. My name is Arturs. So, uh, finally, I got my word. Uh, thank you for a very inspiring presentation. You're welcome. Um, uh, also, inspiring business case or uh, either uh, life story so far. And uh, also, uh, I'm, it's very nice to see that uh, business can be not only uh, very good and well money bringer, but also socially responsible. So, thank you very much. You're but uh, getting to the question is. Um, uh, what was uh, at the very beginning when you just started, what was your driving force? Because probably uh, quite a big part of us here uh, have gone through this stage that sometimes it feels like Jesus, it's just not going any further. I can't push it through. True. And so what was this your driving force? So not to drop it, but still continue going on. Mm, great. Um, yeah, I guess the, the hardest point of my whole journey uh, was the day that Waitrose said no. You know, I'd put all of my love and whatever little money I had into this idea, and it was all wrong. I had to throw it in the bin and start all over again. And that was a point where family and friends and people around me said, hey, if we were in your shoes, this is where we would quit. It hasn't worked. Why don't you try something else? But somewhere in there, Waitrose said, well, you've done it all wrong, but there's a good idea in there. And I listened to what they said. And so it sounds kind of cheesy, but the only person you need to listen to is the customer. And if they're telling you, yeah, if you change it, maybe we'll buy it, you know, that can give you hope to, to keep going. Uh, so I really believe this was something that the customer wanted, that people wanted to buy. Um, I had just done it wrong. So that, that's, that's, what motivates, that's what motivates me, um, I think. Are you saying that uh, businessmen should be really humble when they listen to their customers? Um, I guess maybe the reason that it worked was I went to this huge company and presented my idea and I didn't know anything about anything. And I told them, I said, I don't know anything about supermarkets or how to do this, but this is my idea. This is what I want to do. Um, is it a good idea? They said, yeah, it's a good idea. 
um, well, how do I make it work? He said, well, if you do this and this and this, come back in a year. And then I did those three things and went back. Um, so I guess don't, don't be afraid of just asking the customer what the answer is. Don't, so don't, don't be don't, too proud to, to not just Don't ask. be too proud to look stupid. <laughs> yeah. And be stupid, actually. Absolutely, yeah. Yeah. Uh, pēdējais jautājums mums tur bija pēdējais lūdzu. The last yeah, question. Labdienu. Ah, good day, sorry, in English. So my name is Raitis. I'm working in LED business. But I have a, a question about idea generation. Okay. Are you the only one person who is generating these ideas or maybe you are buying them or maybe you have some team mm. who is doing? Uh, about X, I understood that was your or your friend's idea, mm. but how is it changed now? Yeah, great. Um, yeah, so how, how to come up with ideas? Um, so it, all of these ideas, everything we work on, we get ideas from all different members of the team, from our customers, from friends. You can get ideas from anyone and from anywhere. Um, Sometimes I, I maybe come and speak at an event like this, and afterwards maybe someone will come up to me and they'll say, hey, I've got an idea for a business. And I'll say, oh, what's your idea? And say, oh, I'm not going to tell you. It's a secret. You might steal it. <laughs> and I say, well, to me that's upside down. And I think it's the way a lot of people think about their ideas. They think that there are these precious things they have to keep a secret. But the thing I found is that by telling people my ideas, they would maybe say, well, have you thought about it this way? Or, Oh, my brother works at this place, you should talk to him. And so if you have an idea, tell everybody. Uh, listen to, to their feedback, bash it around a little bit, and you might end up with coming up with something even better. And it's easy to talk about idea to sell a grandmother's jam <laughs> as something unique. Somebody could steal, really. <laughs> All right, thank you very much. Thank you. Fraser. Thanks very much. And a super jam and a beer 52 and a coffee and envelope. Thank you very much.